Shalom from Jerusalem. This is uh, Watchman Talk uh, on TV7 News Israel, a series of conversations with Israeli military, diplomatic, security, and intelligence professionals. And our special guest uh, today is retired Major General Yair Golan, a former Vice Chief of Staff of the Israeli military, along with other positions. In the uh, last government, uh, you served as uh, Deputy Minister. But uh, the uh, brunt of our talk today would uh, uh, focus on security and military affairs. And first, let's uh, talk about uh, your own steps up the ladder of the Israeli Defense Forces um, until the uh, second most uh, top position of uh, Vice Chief of Staff, or Ramatkal, as it is called uh, in Israel. Um, you uh, grew up um, in the uh, family of a career army officer, uh, a senior communications uh, officer. Signal, Now, signal officer. Signal officer, yeah. Yeah. yes. Now it's communications, <laughs> computers, yeah, C, yeah, yeah. 3i and all of that. But at yeah. that time it was just simply the signal core. Now, um, it would surprise many people around the world who believe that Israel is a garrison state to know that there are not too many second generation officers uh, because Israel doesn't have a military academy and it is not uh, traditional that when uh, someone um, is a career officer, their children also uh, choose this path. So what made you follow in your father's footsteps, in a way, your brother who was a paratrooper? Well, I wouldn't say that uh, it's a kind of, uh, you know, a family business. It's much more a coincidence, uh, more than anything else. Uh, my father, uh, well, he, he asked me to join the Signal Corps, you know, and they liked the idea of, you know, some kind of uh, family heritage. But unfortunately, Uh, It's like his, a law business. To well, his to his disappointment, uh, I joined the paratroop corps, and so I, I think that there is no true truly. It's not the like you know, uh, southern uh, United States where you have families of generations and generations in the military. This is not the issue. So um, mm -hmm. when you enlisted in 1980. Um, You didn't see yourself staying in for more than 35 years, almost 40 years. Well, I have no clue, except the fact that, you know, I, I was very enthusiastic when I was conscripted because it was for me a kind of a dream. I used to sit with my uh, brother and his friends listening to all the stories about uh, boot camp and you, all other, you know, military experience. And for me, it was a kind of, as a small kid, it was, for me, it, it was, it was fabulous. Uh, I was fascinated. So when I was conscripted, I was full with uh, vigor and enthusiasm, you know, to join and do my best in order to be a paratrooper. In fact, I was accepted to pilot course, but I gave up this opportunity because from my perspective at that time, to be a paratrooper is the most fantastic thing a young guy in Israel could wish for himself. The paratroopers, of course, were the elite regiment, um, yeah. uh, the spearhead of, of uh, most of Israel's campaigns. Have you ever regretted not becoming um, a pilot, a fighter pilot? Not, not even once. I think I was uh, well fitted to, well, to... to To the destiny and, and to my destiny, I, I would say. But you are, looking from outside, <laughs> you are both aggressive and creative. These are very good uh, qualities for a senior Air Force officer. Did you ever have the chance uh, to fly backseat? Yeah, a lot. In fact, I flew on F-16, F-15, training uh, aircrafts, and uh, so I, I, I like flying. Uh, Were you given uh, the chance for a moment uh, to steer the plane? Uh, yeah, of course, many times. <laughs> yes, I, I like it very much. I like to be in the air. I like to jump. 
from airplanes, which seems to be very what, what the Americans, strange for pilots. Right, what, what the Americans call leaving a perfectly good airplane yeah, yeah. voluntarily. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when you joined, this was after the Yom Kippur War, which was essentially, um, nobody knew it at the time, but essentially, yeah. except for one short stint in 1982, the last time the Israeli Defense Forces clashed with Arab armies, yeah. rather than uh, organizations, militias like uh, Hezbollah, Hezbollah or, or the Palestinians. Yeah, in yeah. 1982, for, for a short time in the Bekaa Valley and other places in Lebanon, the Syrian forces there encountered yeah. Israeli I, armor. I was Lebanon. there, I fought the Syrians. Yes, but, but you probably, as you looked ahead, you probably saw yourself in battles similar to the 1967 and 73 wars, didn't you? You, you, you are right. You are totally right. And I think that was what is so fascinating about the military profession. Um, you think you know what you are heading. And in fact, during the years, I understood that it's completely different. And from my perspective, it was, at that time, it was a great challenge. All right. How to cope with terrorists, how to cope with guerrilla warfare, uh, what is insurgency and counterinsurgency warfare. Uh, and I would say that uh, I explore uh, new fields of the military professions and I enjoy it. You know, it, it was a kind of um, revelation, you know, to, to understand that, all right, it's not exactly what I thought before. It's something else, and the something else is fascinating from a professional point of view. One interesting piece of military history which you delved into and wrote about was the French experience in Algeria. Yeah. And you wrote um, about both the professional and the moral qualms of um, young French officers, you obviously identified with the company commanders, the junior officers who were there in the field, um, in the uh, most populated urban areas of uh, Algier, um, between their um, political echelons and the population yeah. in France, and what happened on the ground. And you wrote about it. Did you see it uh, as an analogy to what is happening between Israel and the of Palestinians? Course. Of course, of course. What, what yes. was the lesson? I think, I think that uh, if you look at what happened to France in Algeria, it's pretty much the same what we have in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. We try to impose ourselves uh, on a hostile population. Uh, they don't want us. And still you have a lot of, you know, commercial relationship, um, even social relationship with the Arab citizens of Israel. And so this mixture of, you know, ordinary daily life with violence and hated and, and haters and, and, and you know, all together this mixture, uh, what I learn, what I take out of it, it's impossible. It's impossible. This illusion that, all right, yes, we can live together and we can, uh, it, 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 it will come true somehow. No way. The level of uh, hostility between the two people and the blood account between the two people is so formidable that you cannot, you know, ignore it. You cannot forget it. And the fact that, yes, we can experience uh, weeks and even months without any hostile uh, activity, that's nothing more than illusion. And what I take from my military service that we need to disintegrate ourselves from the Palestinians. To we need to separate ourselves from the Palestinians. There is no other way. Uh, all what we are doing right now is a kind of a self disaster. Is a kind of you know national suicide, uh, and I think it's such a you know it's not just about ideology. It's from also from the mil very military perspective, professional perspective, you know, learning this issue for years 
and wrote about it and, uh, expl- and, and you know, made uh, my own inquiries into this subject. And what I figure out is that there is no way we are going to live together peacefully for eternity. Why we, you know, with, with this friction, you know, this fr- constant friction between two hostile populations. We'll go back to Lebanon and your experiences from company commander to brigade commander. You went up uh, in the ranks uh, in the 20 years uh, since you enlisted and until Israel left uh, Lebanon. Um, you fought there, you, you were wounded there um, in a firefight or, or in an ambush. Uh, we'll go back to that. But then you had uh, five senior, five general officer jobs as the um, commanding general of the division guarding the Lebanon border, the commanding general of the West Bank division, and then home front, Northern Command, vice chief of staff. But going to the West Bank, you found yourself uh, with your moral compass and um, your understanding of what the future of Israel must hold, perhaps will not hold, but according to your vision, and yet tactically or operationally on the ground, you had to undertake operations. Um, For instance, um, in some uh, very, very limited way, using human shields, for which uh, taking a neighbor, taking a neighbor to call on his... It's not a human shield, but all right. Go ahead, explain it, please. First, I I would like to say that with my, you know... uh, national and strategic understanding, that's never uh, limited my uh, ability uh, to fight tat- tactically, you know, in order to, to fight terrorism, to fight, you know, anyone who want to harm Israeli citizens. An aggressive, so, peace-loving officer. Yeah, something like that. But uh, I would say that um, I, I, I don't see any problem, you know. Contradiction. Put, you know, putting together this, you know, overall understanding that we need mili- in the military to create the best condition for the political echelons and at the same time, uh, do the things in on the ground in the most, I would say, professional and moral manner. Because in most cases, while dealing with civilian population, the most professional attitude is compo- composing profession and moral consideration together. Otherwise, you... Uh, corrupt the soul of your soldiers. And I want young soldiers to enter the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, uh, as uh, healthy persons and go out of it as healthy persons, as uh, normal citizens for, um, I would say, for... for um, for the good of the for, country and of for themselves. For the good of the country and for uh, to become uh, contributing citizens for the Israeli society. Now, when, when you are in charge of the, the uh, West Bank, it's a division. It has six or seven territorial brigades. Uh, you must go after suspected terrorists. Um, intelligence tells you that they are uh, now preparing an attack either within Israel proper or against a settlement or, or against yeah. the road. You must send uh, your troops to intercept them. Uh, and you have in mind what you said about the general picture of how in the future Israelis and Palestinians will live together. And then you have to balance the mission, the welfare, well-being, and lives of your soldiers, and what happens to the population, uh, so that innocents will not be harmed, but the perpetrators will be caught or exactly. killed. Exactly. How do you do, how do you go about that? It sounds uh, so complicated. Uh, it is very complicated, 
But by the years, and you know, I served in Judea and Samaria since I was 18. So by the years, you manage to understand uh, what is the true tactical problem, the true tactical challenge, and what is the right level of power is needed? What is the level of violence? Not maximum which, power, um, not optimal. The optimal, yes. And optimal, the meaning of being in the optimum uh, means that on the one hand, you know how to hit the right target without imposing any harm on others, on civilians, on innocents, and by that, calming the situation. Otherwise, you create more hate, more violence, and more um, motivation to impose terror events on Israeli civilians and against your own troops. So it's a, this, this notion of balancing a delicate using, balance of using you know the the proper level of violence it's that it's, it doesn't mean that all right i'm a kind of a pacifist a leftist uh, person it's about the, the the most professional manner to conduct your own operations uh, inside palestinian cities now, it became even more complicated um, after the first uh, 14 years or so of your service when Israel signed the Oslo Accords uh, yeah. with the new uh, Palestinian Authority and you uh, had to cooperate with the uh, Palestinian security forces. And then it all backfired or went backwards in late uh, 2000. And uh, uh, second intifada, yeah, yes, and and was um, more and more ominous for Israeli citizens yeah. with terror acts in Israeli cities. And you were in charge of uh, a regular infantry brigade, the Nahal Brigade, when um, eventually the Israeli government uh, saw uh, no other recourse but to enter Palestinian refugee camps and uh, towns and yeah. cities. And you actually led the first raid into one of those strongholds when a casualty averse Israeli leadership was fearful that this will end very badly. And you proved that it was not so. Yeah. Tell us about it. Well, this is 20 say, years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the most, uh, the first, in fact, I led the first operation into what we used to call B plus uh, sectors. ABC is yeah. the West Bank yeah, yeah. Uh, divided well, into sectors. Yeah. And I conducted in December 2000 a raid on 2000. Already? 2000, yes. December 2000 against Atsirai Shamalia. Okay. Uh, a bit north of Nablus. Where a few months earlier there was there was a tragic incident between two Israeli exactly. forces. Exactly. And I can tell you that one of the most, at that time, the most prominent officers in the IDF told me the following. It's going to be a disaster. A massacre. It's a massacre for your a own soldiers. A massacre soldiers. for your own troops. It's, you know, so dangerous. Don't do it. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's crazy. And I told him, look, well, I wouldn't say it's nothing, but I I'm, I'm, have such a confidence concerning the ability of my brigade to conduct successfully this operation that I have no hesitation about it. And I was right. I well, was right. Where did you position yourself that, that day or that night? Were you ahead of I the troops or were you in a command post? We raid 14 different locations simul simultaneously. It was very complicated. We came from four different directions. To orchestrate it. So to orchestrate it, uh, I was in my commanding position, a bit out of the village. But the minute we were on the houses, I entered the village because that's what I believe in. You need to lead from the front 
You need to be there. You need to understand the tactical considerations and to, you, you need to demonstrate leadership to show people that, yes, I am totally uh, committed to, a, to fulfill this mission no matter what are the difficulties on the ground. But the Israeli defense forces, by using such tactics, lost colonels and even yeah. generals. Yeah. Um, is, is that um, a cost-effective way to lead an army? Yeah, the, the answer is absolutely positive because there is no other way to take the right decisions without understanding, you know, what what the company commander, what the battalion commander truly experienced. Uh, I think that, you know, in a way we neglected this lesson in the Second Lebanon War. Commanders used to be a bit in the rear, and that was such a terrible mistake. And you by the way, and, be, and, and this is only- to be in the front. But this is only a few kilometers inside Lebanon, yeah. and the Israeli border is very no, no, close you by. Need to be, the, the main lesson I could, you know, recommend others is you, you never ever send a, a platoon leader or company commander without being just aside him. You know, you need to see his eyes. Also, you need you, to understand. Also, you, this is how you mentor them. Yeah. Exactly. Now, uh, and you were a colonel uh, a few years earlier in Lebanon when you were wounded in the clash that um, uh, you recalled. Um, again, your family um, heard about it, and yet they supported you in staying on um, because you were very close to becoming a general officer. Mm -hmm. It's the peak of your career. Nevertheless, they were worried about you, but let you go on with your career. Look, I was at that time about 35. I was a career officer. There was no question about whether I'm heading. You know, it's, it's my life. It's the story of my life. And I truly thank my wife, Ruti, for being such a supportive person for so, for so many years. And at the same time, having five boys, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a tough job for her. And without her, I couldn't fulfill my mission. You were known already at the time as an up and coming officer, and you even chose um, a small uh, deviation from the regular career path by uh, going to the operations division of the general staff. And you saw um, on this level, how the military is run. Um, yeah. this, this was uh, quite an important step for you, wasn't it? It was fantastic. You know, by, by, you, know you move from one position to other position. And Up the chain of command. Yeah, and the day after, you start to have a different perspective on the things you have done for so many years. So it's extremely important. And I can tell you that when I commanded my infantry brigade during the second intifada, my experience in the general staff was so important because I could guess what are the considerations, what are the limitations, what are, uh, um, you know, which what is are the which really, is what what are the true needs what, of, which is, of which the is what? higher echelons? Right. Even we, when they don't say it, you know. Yeah, directly. you have to interpret it. So uh, when you go to to uh, military schools, uh, command and staff, or national security yeah. uh, college, you uh, are supposed to study two echelons above. Yeah. Um, but the real study is the university of the so-called hole in the underground bunker of yeah. the general staff. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, you um, were uh, in charge of the Lebanon border after Israel uh, withdrew from Lebanon, after yeah. first fighting within Lebanon and seeing your commanding officer, uh, Brigadier General Erz Gerstein, uh, being killed there by yeah. an um, improvised uh, explosive device. Um, you came back. It was uh, quiet, 
Uh, this was uh, in the it was in, not quiet. No, it, <laughs> it was in the interim yeah. between 2000 and the uh, next campaign in 2006. And you prepared the border uh, for another war, but unfortunately, you weren't there to command it when when uh, yeah. the balloon went up. So, what would you have done? I know it's not fair to ask, not fair to for to others. But what you, would you have done differently had you been in charge of the so-called 91st Division, um, which well, is f- which is where the s- it's it's an uh, easy question, you know, because um, I prepare for such a war, uh, and I think I managed to prepare all Northern Command and all the land forces in order to be ready for the Second Lebanon War. I, I could say today that I envisioned the war in a very, well, in, in a very accurate manner. Uh, unfortunately. In a plan you called right positions or correct no, positions? No, it was absolutely clear for me that you cannot uh, win this war without uh, true land operation. So it's the old, the old debate about fire versus movement. We will we will uh, go into that you, in, in our... Me, for me, it was absolutely clear that we need to be there with maximum power uh, to be very... Um, to use our ability to maneuver much better than the Hezbollah uh, to... Um, go to, to, to enter, to penetrate any village, any town in, the, in the southern Lebanon and not allowing them uh, to be in their bunkers and, you know, General, surviving there. General Golan, to be continued, not necessarily worse, but to be continued, our conversation for the time being. Thank you. And we will be back with the second part of our conversation with retired Major General Yair Golan very soon. For the time being, shalom from Jerusalem. This has been Watchman Talk.